All right, I say that we get started. So thanks everyone. Hello and welcome to the Quora's Forum on Navigating the Future of Persistent Identifiers in Scholarly Publishing, Challenges, Risks, and Opportunities. Today's forum of over 200 registrants would not be possible without the generous sponsorship coming from ACM, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, RTI Press, and STM. So today's forum um, is, is done on Zoom. So uh, as we have questions, please feel free to use the QA box on the bottom and also up update things. Quorus is a community effort dedicated to making open research work. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders or publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We work to develop metrics about open data. We improve the overall quality of their metadata related to open research. And we host forums and workshops like today's forum to connect the stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with each other. So today's session is very central to Chorus's mission. And as we, as we use PIDs every day in our dashboards and reports, monitoring articles for open access on publishers' sites, whether an article is archived for preservation at Clocks and or Portico, and whether a preprint has been deposited in a repository, or if an article is appearing on an agency portal, and whether there are public grant information, whether authors have ORCID ID records, and whether there are relevant data sets connected to those articles. All of this is being made as transparent as possible to our stakeholders. So um, as you can see that we've got a great lineup of speakers today, and I just wanted to turn this immediately over to Alice Meadows from the More Brains Cooperative to take us forward. Alice, over to you. Thanks, Howard, and thanks to you and Chorus for the opportunity to moderate what I think is going to be a really interesting uh, conversation. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit from me, and I'll introduce myself in a minute, and then from our speakers, John Chidaki, uh, Carly Robinson, Scott Deneen, and Amanda French. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and give a little bit more context to what they do. You can read their affiliations here. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself, um, and then we'll look at the poll results, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of a sort of... Uh, overview introduction context for this talk. So um, as it says, I'm the co-founder of the More Brains Cooperative, which is a small scholarly communications consultancy that specializes particularly in sort of open research and research infrastructure. My background is originally in scholarly publishing, which is actually where I first became involved in Chorus. Um, I led the first um, Chorus communications and outreach group. Uh, and I moved from there to ORCID, which is where my love of uh, PIDs, persistent identifiers really began. Uh, then to NISO, the National Information Standards Organization, and now very happy to be continuing to do a lot of work on PIDs, including a lot on national PID strategies, which you're going to hear a bit more from <clears throat> uh, John Shiraki on. So next slide, please, Howard. So um, before the meeting, we sent out uh, a short poll asking two questions and, and question number, nearly 40 of you replied to this. So this is, again, just a, for a bit of kind of context, we asked you what the main benefits and what the main barriers were for using PIDs for your organisation. So you can see this word cloud, what comes out, and it's probably not surprising given what I think the audience for this um, this webinar is that, you know, research and tracking uh, came out very, very strongly here. There's a number of others, metadata outputs, discoverability. What's quite interesting to me about this is some of the work that we've been doing with national PID strategy organisations around the world. We have asked similar questions of the community. And although tracking and uh, discoverability and uh, research come out strongly there as well. Some other things also come out strongly, like open, which is quite tiny on here. So supporting open research, uh, interoperability, which is also fairly small here. Um, and in particular, sort of um, uh, relieving the admin burden, which again, um, it comes out here a little bit, but it's interesting to me that the, the weighting is a little different from the people who responded um, to, this, to this poll. Uh, next slide, please. So when it comes to um, the barriers and apologies that this is a bit fuzzy, I think we did what we could to make it less fuzzy, but um, it, is a, it is a little blurry. Uh, but again, lots of different things came up here. Um, I think a couple worth mentioning. I think the lack of, it was interesting, somebody said lack of social interoperability, which I haven't heard expressed in that way. But I think this idea of 
kind of culture change, getting people to accept change is every bit as difficult, if not honestly more so than um, than the technical uh, issues in many ways. I was interested that um, cost didn't come up here, um, which again, in the in the surveys that we've done of sort of national communities, that's come up often as a, as a concern for um, for, for people. Uh, but there's a lot here that totally makes sense. <clears throat> the interoperability is uh, both, a, both a benefit and a barrier. Adoption, lack of buy-in, I think at all levels, both senior and uh, the researchers is, is a big deal. So no, no big surprises here, but just maybe a little different from some of the responses we've had to similar questions in different communities, just a little different weighting. Next slide, please, Howard. Okay, so I am going to sort of as I say, try and give you a bit of context, a bit of an overview um, for this uh, discussion that we're going to have. Next slide, please. I'm going to make the assumption that most of you are pretty familiar with what a persistent identifier is, but I did want to share um, uh, a definition that I like, uh, just sort of, sort of get us all on the same page. This is stolen from um, the US Department of Energy's uh, Office of Science and Technical Information, and you'll be hearing from Carly there shortly. So thank you, Carly, for for this. Um, I like this one and you'll see I've highlighted certain words in it. <clears throat> so I, I really like you know, digital identifiers globally unique. So, you know, there are plenty of identifiers that are unique within an organization or maybe even within a country, but PIDs are globally unique. They're persistent and now persistent is something that the PID itself isn't necessarily, but the organizations that work with it um, need, to, need to embrace this no notion of persistence. Machine resolvability is very critical, obviously, as is metadata. And then this, um, you know, an identifier identifies, but that identification is used often to disambiguate, which is a very big problem, or has historically been a very big problem um, in the research world. So I think this really sums up, this definition, it really sums up a lot of what's important and valuable about PIDs. So I wanted to give you a few examples of sort of research workflow challenges and how PIDs can resolve them and then some opportunities that PIDs can support. So this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I think we can all agree that researchers spend too much time on admin and too little time actually doing their research. Some statistics show that horrifyingly, it's as little as 17% of their time. Others are a bit more generous, but it's still typically less than half their time on research. Demonstra demonstrating the uh, return on investment in research can be very challenging, particularly over time. Um, and the research evaluation process for grants and promotion and tenure, and this is a direct quote from somebody we spoke to in a country not to be named, detested and a huge administrative burden. So not, not good things, any of these. However, PIDs can help. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So on the admin uh, side of things, um, PIDs basically allow data to be entered once and then reused across multiple systems. So if we had a world where PIDs were integrated into all the research systems, that information could be entered once and then just flow seamlessly between the different systems, um, allowing researchers to spend less time on the admin and more on research. The burdensome research evaluation um, can be helped by the fact that PIDs can store and maintain data, for example, in ORCID, and then that information can be pulled from the ORCID record when and where, whenever it's needed. ROI um, can be helped by um, showing the sort of connections between researchers and their organisations and their grants and their outputs. So you get that sort of big picture of, of um, what, what your investment is actually achieving. And then the conducting research analysis the metrics and connections, as I said, will over time will be much easier if PIDs are widely adopted. So I love this example. I'm sure some of you have seen it before because it gets um, shared quite a lot because we, we don't have as many examples of PIDs really um, uh, in a very concrete way solving a research workflow problem as we would like. But this is a great one from Joe Shapter, who's a senior academic in Australia. Now that the Australian Research Council um, has integrated ORCID, instead of it taking three or four days for him to complete a grant application, you know, loading all his publications and conferences and so on, it now takes a few hours. Um, so uh, he's super happy about this. All he has to do now, everything gets pulled in, he just needs to check it and he's saving himself three or four days per grant application. So now looking on the sort of opportunities side, I think, again, just a few examples. Uh, I think we all agree we want to make data fair. It would be great to have more support for collaboration in research. 
there's been a, an issue for a long time in terms of lack of attribution or, or, or not as much attribution and recognition as there should be for research and researchers, and then making research more diverse, equitable and inclusive. And again, PIDs can help with all these opportunities. So basically, you can't be fair without PIDs. Um, PIDs and their metadata are absolutely central to a, a large a number of the FAIR principles. Um, so, so that's a, a sort of a, an unobvious one. Um, the fact that PIDs ena enable these reliable connections between researchers and their organisations and outputs means that collaboration is easier. It's easier to identify collaborators and see who's working in the same areas as you, whether that's an organisation or an individual. Um, PIDs help to ensure that the right people and organisations get the credit that they deserve. And that includes things like you know, equipment and instruments and archives. So it's not just about sort of um, universities or, or, or government organisations. And open PIDs are available to everyone. Um, so, for example, you know, ORCID and Crossref and DataSite and some of these other uh, open PID organisations have APIs that are open, their metadata is open, and that means that everybody can benefit from them. And this, I'm hoping the, yeah, the animation works. So this is an example, actually, from some work that we've been doing for the uh, national PID strategy um, in Ireland, uh, and this demonstrates the percentage of global um, Irish co-authorships, and it's powered by PIDs, basically. We we plug the PIDs in and it shows up over time where the different global collaborations are happening between Irish authors and uh, those in the rest of the world. So just to, to finish up with, um, I want to make a couple of final points. First of all, we often talk about priority PIDs, but actually I think it makes more sense to think about the entities for which those PIDs uh, are used. Um, so because the PIDs themselves, there may be different PIDs that would work better in different communities. So the entities that we have found in our work uh, come up again and again as priorities are research outputs, um, researchers and other contributors to research, so people, research projects, and uh, research organisations, so institutions, funders and others. Now, in some national contexts, other things bubble up. So in Australia, for example, um, they have a very big uh, a science community. So they were very keen on um, uh, identifiers for uh, samples. Physical samples were a big issue for them. So that would be another priority entity. But these four uh, general types of entities crop up again and again and again as being the ones that people really want to make sure there are identifiers for. And that leads me on to, um, this is a very early stage, so we have permission to share this with you. It's not publicly available yet, but uh, we've been working with the Canadians as well on um, their national PIS strategy. And one of the things that we've been doing with them is to come up with a sort of a matrix to enable the selection of the best PIDs for the, for the entities that they want to um, have identifiers for. Um, and this includes all sorts of different uh, criteria, how open they are, what the coverage is, uh, what the metadata availability is, that kind of thing. But the idea is that this can be used as a tool to make informed decisions based on community needs about which, once you know what your priority entities are, which are the best PIDs um, to meet those needs. And then finally, um, this is our kind of like nirvana, if you like. This is what we would love to see um, in a PID optimized research cycle. So PIDs being used at every stage around the cycle. It's an open cycle, so metadata can move from one system to another. It's efficient, everything's automated, so there's um, less errors. It's quicker, easier for everyone. It's trackable. You've got those nice links between the different PIDs and their metadata that enable the connections to be analyzed. And it's persistent. And as I I think alluded to briefly, this is a social rather than a technical construct. Um, and it, it means that um, investment in PIDs needs to be a community effort by funders, research institutions, publishers, and honestly, others as well. Um, so that's the end of my sort of introduction. And I am going to hand over now to John, who is going to tell us a little bit about um, the work that he and Todd Carpenter have been doing to develop a US national PID strategy. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you, Alice. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about work that we've been doing as part of that U.S. National PID Strategy Working Group, um, but also really taking um, a step back from the specifics of different identifiers and identifier names and brand names and really thinking kind of about the desirable characteristics that we as communities and as nations and as groups and 
you know, workplaces um, should be looking for when we are looking to adopt PIDs. So kind of that conceptual model that's uh, one step out. So for some people in, on the call, this may be um, no brainer stuff, but I think one of the things that we found during our working group was that this kind of baseline understanding of characteristics for PID infrastructure and what do we mean when we use the term PID or persistent identifier, what is it that we're actually looking for? You know, that's been very helpful for people just to have that baseline. Uh, so, um, as Alice said, um, I am here representing a working group that was co-led by myself and Todd Carpenter from NISO. Um, next slide. Um, our working group started uh, in, kind of had its beginnings in 2022, uh, where the ORFG and Helios groups came together to launch uh, some work streams around improving research outputs. And uh, our work stream was one of those. And uh, in conjunction with RDA and RDA US, uh, using the framework created by the RDA National Pitch Strategies Interest Group and much of the work that Alice was referring to, um, we went through a series of community calls and working groups to come up with a report that um, is linked in the document and we can put uh, links in the chat as well. Um, our goal right now is to, uh, we have finished drafting our recommendations. Right now we're circulating these recommendations and talking about them through forums like this and to um, move these uh, through the conversation that we have, move these into a more formal standards process where we can do more consensus building across the American landscape uh, for a national pitch strategy. Um, next slide. So one of the things that we really uh, dove into during our working group around how to build a strategy for something as complex as the American public and, <laughs> and research landscape is that um, we really wanted to sit down and talk about what are the stakeholders that we're, we're looking to um, support. And just as Alice was mentioning, it's very important to have this very concrete understanding of the different groups that are at play when you're looking at persistent identifiers and, and looking at the benefits of embracing uh, pitified um, work, uh, work streams and, and workflows. Um, but one of the things that we also wanted to look at was not just these kind of traditional stakeholder groups from the perspective of um, of their their workplace or where they where where they are within the tool chain. But if we go to the next slide, also really looking at what are some of the comprehensive uh, benefits that happen regardless of your position in the stakeholder groups. Many people like myself are, you know, both at an academic institution uh, in an administrative role, as well as um, a PID provider and infrastructure provider. So, you know, with different hats on um, at different points in the ecosystem, but what is the common benefit that works across all of those stakeholder groups for working within PID groups and making sure that we have a common understanding of that so that as we move forward for a common national strategy or any sort of strategy that we have those these ideas in, in place. And so, you know, just with the theme of today's uh, conversation about how we move from barriers to reality, you know, really trying to understand what PIDs do for us. And so within our working group, uh, we talked a lot about the reduction of administrative burden, the ability, as Alice was mentioning, to offer cost savings and scalability of systems and information flowing, looking at ways of improving research assessment. And I think one of the larger uh, goals for um, agencies, funding groups, uh, institutions, and researchers themselves is really around this idea of tackling research integrity. So creating accountability and transparency so that we can foster more trust and credibility within, but also to within the scholarly community, but also out into the public. Uh, next slide. But when we, we're talking about these benefits, we're always talking about, well, what is it that we're, you know, what is it that we're aiming for? And I think the meat of this presentation is really in this slide. It's it's what we worked on within the working group and uh, to define as characteristics that each of us should be looking for when we look for PID systems. So very often um, the term gets thrown around. People talk about the brand names of Crossref Data Site, ROAR, these other, other entities. And we're not talking about the baseline infrastructure and understanding that is uh, below that. And so within our uh, report that we put up on um, Zenodo, as well as a complimentary blog post that we put up on the upstream Force 11 blog that's just been put into Slack, uh, or sorry, into chat, um, we really dig deep into what are those characteristics. 
Um, the goal of this discussion is really to make sure that each of us across the working group, but across the community and with you here today in the forum, really understand what persistent identifiers mean um, and what is technically and socially part of that definition. And so within that definition, the things that we wanted to highlight were that persistent identifiers, unlike other ID systems or other ways of cataloging or putting things together or archiving things um, are really about making sure there is social constructs for stability and persistence and a guarantee that can be can be seen to have a long-term vision. It's about global uniqueness so that you have the ability to have a global unique identifier, not just one that is locally unique within your company or your system or your institution or your repository, but one that is globally unique. Also one that is resolvable. So we really wanna make sure persistent identifier infrastructure has the ability for you to resolve, typically through a URL and enable access to the metadata and the information and the digital object that is not just human uh, retrievable, but also machines are able to retrieve the metadata so that we can have ways for information exchange to happen at scale. Um, also that that metadata is openly available. Many people don't understand that there are ways that many, there are a lot of systems that actually have closed metadata. So that doesn't really help us in a persistent identifier space. We want the metadata around an object to be something that is resolvable and retrievable and has open availability to it. While the data object itself or the thing may be restricted for privacy or, or concerns um, around its contents, the metadata about it should be machine actionable and open so that people are able to use it in systems as well as um, uh, human readable formats. Additionally, um, desirable characteristics for persistent identifier infrastructure includes that community governance. I think Alice brought that up a few times in her intro, that it's really about that social construct. It's about being able to have a community around um, a persistent identifier space that allows for governance and conversations and community input around the, 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 the specific area of interest. Also that there is consistent documentation that is up to date. Um, we don't want to be supporting PID infrastructure that is has stale uh, documentation. The world is in technical terms is changing very rapidly. And also the governance uh, around PIDs should be changing pretty rapidly. We want there to be um, documentation that's up to date, not just around the technical specifications, but also common policies and practices. And that does flow into the other items, which is around monitoring and reporting, the, the ability and the ease of making, assigning identifiers and curating the metadata, the underlying information, and making sure that the, the information that is being created by persistent identifier infrastructure can be exchanged and integrated into other systems. And this last one of interoperability is one of the key aspects that kind of speaks to all of the social and technical characteristics that are up above, which is the goal of, of a persistent identifier infrastructure should be for us to have clean and concise ways of auditing and understanding what's going on within that infrastructure and for there to be plans for the future and for their, not just the future of the governance and the technical specs, but also the preservation of the digital objects themselves. So this kind of social and technical side of things creates the true interoperability. And we, we have this very complex list and this very dense slide here as a way of creating a common definition and a real understanding in, in everybody's mind about what we mean when we say PID infrastructure. Very often we get in conversations where people will say, well, I have an identifier. It's my internal database identifier within my system. And we have to explain, well, that is an identifier. It is true. It does identify things, but it doesn't meet these desirable characteristics. It's not really what the community is aiming for. And I think this baseline understanding and these characteristics are very important as we build any sort of strategy or understanding so that we've removed the focus from the brand names of these, of these communities that are very common into a better understanding of what is the underlying guarantees that we're really wanting to shoot for. Uh, next slide. So with that in mind, um, the recommendations that went that built from that within our working group were really about trying to make sure that we are building um, consistent and clean infrastructure, PID infrastructure within the US context and supporting that. And our recommendations were built in the report you can find on Zenodo 
um, we're, we're segmented into these areas that you'll see here, really trying to make sure that um, similar to what Alice was uh, highlighting from other national PID strategies um, and work that's happened through RDA and other places, that there are um, ways for PID infrastructure be, to be better integrated into compliance um, for the US context, especially with new public access policies. That there's an evaluation that happens when we are looking to adopt or, or to work within PID communities. That there are ways for us to have standardized adoptions and and not and not not you know shy away from picking uh, communities that bring us together because they may um, uh, they may actually be uh, important for us to work through a centralized broker because it does bring us together from that governance and social compact perspective. And really just trying to think about ways um, for us to think of core PID infrastructure services, the, the idea um, that Alice was bringing up around um, specific PID communities that are commonly used, but also those that are foundational to certain types of sciences. These are ones that we want to make sure that we're engaging and supporting um, and championing uh, uh, regularly. Uh, next slide. And one of the main things that we wanted to uh, talk about is this idea that there are legacy systems that exist in our space. Um, just as we spent a lot of time talking about the characteristics of desirable PID infrastructure, we also want to speak to the fact that there are commonly used identifier systems within our space that the US and the world use uh, regularly that do not meet those characteristics. And we need to start building plans for moving them into modern PID systems. And this is one of the main takeaways from our report and something that we all should be thinking about is how do we take our own legacy systems, ones that maybe don't fit all of those criteria and look at how we can evolve them over time to really bring them into the networked research space that we're, we're building towards. And so we want to make sure that we have investment in these areas and that we are looking at ways that we can build new systems, but also really supporting those that already exist. Uh, next slide. And a big thing within that topic of moving away from legacy identifiers is really making sure that we understand that you know a lot of work and energy and existing systems are there uh, that we that we leverage we don't want to break them and we don't want to downplay the work and the energy that's already gone into what has built the foundation so far so really trying to build uh, strategies for moving from where we are now into the future uh, collaboratively and constructively so that we have um, a consistent approach it's really more of a call to action for individual groups that help with registries of information, curation groups and repositories that are working within their own systems, agencies and, and, and funders who have access to metadata about research objects, this, this kind of call to action to start looking at ways to move towards these desirable characteristics. Um, and then the last two slides here are really just about looking at um, where we are. Um, we have been uh, within our working group. Um, as I mentioned, we are we have published the draft recommendations. You'll see those there in Zenodo. Um, we also are we're circulating and, and doing several webinars and discussions with key groups. And we um, have already submitted a, an application to start a NISO working group to further this work as a as a national uh, strategy that is built on a standards process that has a, a formal auditable process that brings in all stakeholder groups. And so we just wanted to acknowledge the fact in the next slide that um, this work was supported by RFG and Helios and Spark, but also RDA and RDA US and RDA US's Tigris program, which is really facilitating the outreach and the, the, the communications around the US national PID strategy. So um, wanted to include that. And then in the next slide, there is uh, the resources listed that will be included in um, the, the slides that are sent out. And we are asked to end with a question. So the question that I would ask to, the, to this group is through this lens of these characteristics, while they were very basic and foundational and in the weeds, um, did you, through this distinction, start to understand um, some legacy identifier systems that exist within your space or within the wider community? And do you have a better understanding of where we as a persistent identifier, as a PID uh, uh, community, as a, uh, you know, what we're aiming for and where we're headed? 
Um, and so that's the, the question to prompt the group. Thanks Thank so you very much, much, John. Thank you. Um, so yes, we, we did ask all the speakers to end with a question or a provocation, and we're hoping that um, you, know, you, the audience, will kind of give some responses or, or share some thoughts on that as well. So moving us on, um, now we're going to Carly Robinson um, of OSTI, the uh, Department of, en of Energy, and Carly, I'll let you introduce yourself and move on. Thank you. Great, thanks, Alice. Yeah, so uh, Carly Robinson, I'm in Department of Energy's Office of Scientific and Technical Information, or OSTE, and um, I wanted to give kind of an overview of the U.S. government context um, around persistent identifiers, um, you know, the, the memos and guidance that us kind of federal agencies are working towards, and then talk a little bit specifically about um, de what Department of Energy is doing around persistent identifiers. So if you go to the next slide, um, I, I have kind of a, a slide each on, on policy guidance that we've received um, a, as federal agencies that mention persistent identifiers. And this really starts with National Security Presidential Memo number 33, which came out at the very end of the last administration in 2021. And this is kind of broadly focused on research security, but there are two places where it specifically talks about persistent identifiers and specifically persistent identifiers for individuals. So it says that federal agencies should establish policies regarding requirements for individual researchers to be registered with a service that provides a persistent identifier for that individual. It also says that agencies should standardize forms for initial disclosure, so um, kind of initial information that is collected with applications for funding, and that within those uh, standard forms, we should include those persistent identifiers for individuals. So this is kind of the, the first guidance that we had received um, from the White House to agencies that includes persistent identifiers. And if you go to the next slide, um, this came out at the end of the last administration. And you know, when the new administration came in, there were questions about kind of what their expectations would be for this memo. And so the new administration worked with federal agencies um, to develop the NSPM 33 implementation guidance to give more guidance to agencies um, about exactly what the expectations are uh, for this memo. And there's an entire section around persistent identifiers, which is really helpful. And I think one of the things that it did in the, the implementation guidance is we had a definition for what we mean by a persistent identifier. Um, and it's very similar to what Alice had shared and I think has a lot of the characteristics that John had shared. And that's a digital identifier that's globally unique persistent, machine resolvable and processable, and has an associated metadata schema. So in the US government context, this is the definition of a persistent identifier that we're using to try to implement these things. Also in the implementation guidance, kind of within that section around persistent identifiers, there's a lot of really helpful information. But one thing that I did wanna point out is it includes the common core standards that a persistent identifier service should meet to be included as an option for providing that disclosure information in federal grant and cooperative agreements. So this is specifically around persistent identifier services for individuals. Next slide. So it said in NSPM 33, the agency should develop these kind of common forms to collect initial disclosure information and uh, agencies work together and, and did that. And that work was led by NSF and NIH. And now that those common forms have come out, uh, the OSTP put out a memo in February of this year that kind of talks about the expectations that agencies use those forms and asked agencies to provide an implementation plan for how they'll use those, those common forms, the biographical sketch and the current and pending support forms. And that deadline of 90 days just passed, so agencies did need to provide their implementation plan by May 14th. And um, included in that implementation plan, it, it does, um, I think most agencies will try to address um, how they will be using persistent identifiers or kind of what, what the plan is there, um, because there, there is that connection with uh, NSPM 33 around persistent identifiers for individuals. And it, it kind of mentions that um, persistent identifiers uh, requirements need to be in line with the NSTC um, 
uh, at NSTM 33 implementation guidance and the 2022 OSTP public access policy guidance. And if you go to the next slide, I think uh, most of you all are probably pretty familiar with the 2022 OSTP public access memo um, that kind of built on the previous memo related to publications and data, but it also had a section all about persistent identifiers. And it's broader than kind of the expectations that are in NSPM 33, but it connects to them. And so what it says around persistent identifiers is that um, agencies are expected to collect and make publicly available metadata associated with publications and data, um, including you know, author names, affiliations, sources of funding, those of which um, should reference persistent identifiers as appropriate. And also that each of these outputs should have a persistent identifier associated with them. It also connects directly to NSPM 33, where um, uh, in the language it says that we are to instruct federally funded researchers to obtain a persistent identifier that meets those common core standards in the implementation guidance. Um, also that researchers should use their persistent identifiers in the research that they're publishing, and also when providing um, kind of reporting on their research outputs to their federal funders. And then lastly, it talks about persistent identifiers for awards and intramural research protocols and the expectation for agencies to assign those. Um, that's a space that I think uh, there's still a lot of, uh, well, all of this, there's a lot of discussion, but that that's an area that I think um, will include broader discussion as well. And so one of the expectations of the OSTP memo um, was for agencies to either provide a new or updated public access plan. And so if you go to the next slide, um, Department of Energy did put out our public access plan on uh, June of last year. And we do have a section talking about our, our implementation plans for persistent identifiers, specifically focused on research outputs, people, and organizations, um, and you know need to have kind of more discussion and more understanding about the expectations for awards, um, and then we'll plan to kind of update that. And so I want to transition to uh, kind of talking about the work that we've already done within Department of Energy and specifically my office, OSTI. So if you go to the next slide, I want to kind of talk about how my office fits within uh, the agency and how that relates to our persistent identifier work. So DOE, like other uh, federal agencies, we, we fund research. We fund about 15 billion annually that goes out to the DOE National Laboratories, um, you know, grantees at universities, other institutions, technology centers, sites. And of course, from that funding comes research output. So, you know, journal articles and accepted manuscripts, data sets, software, patents. And that's where my office comes in. Our role within the Department of Energy is to collect, preserve, and make accessible DOE-funded research outputs. And so um, kind of through that work is how we have gotten kind of involved and really invested in using persistent identifiers. So if you go to the next slide, um, you know, one of the things that we do is provide search tools for finding DOE funded uh, research outputs and, you know, have kind of traditional metadata record pages that'll, you know, link to the resource itself. And this is an example of one of those pages. And what we're trying to do is within the metadata include as many persistent identifiers as possible. And this is kind of what we're working towards. So this is a data set record that came out of one of the DOE National Laboratories. We worked um, with the data repository to assign a DOI to that data set. Uh, the repository is really great about collecting ORCID IDs for all of their authors um, and the data creators. And so they pass those ORCID IDs on to us so that we can put them in the DOI metadata. Um, one of the things that we're working towards is including um, persistent identifiers for all of the organization metadata as well. Um, so we'll be showing kind of ROAR IDs for author affiliations, um, research organizations, sponsoring and funding organizations. You know, we collect our, our internal identifiers for funding, you know, contract grant numbers, but we can see a future where those will have, for example, DOIs that in addition to our internal numbers, we can have the persistent identifiers for those. And we're also working to con connect these research outputs. So um, this data, uh, 
record that has a DOI references a publication. So we've got that DOI to DOI connection. It's cited by another data set and references software. So we're trying to connect those all together with persistent identifiers as well. And we have a whole team of uh, kind of curators who are working to add this metadata if it doesn't come to us from, from the creators of this information and trying to enhance that metadata. And if you go to the next slide, we have a, a lot of different services where we are kind of offering uh, persistent identifier services. So um, assigning DOIs to research outputs if they're not getting a DOI from another source. We lead the US government ORCID consortium and have an ORCID integration with our search tool, OSTI.gov. Um, we have a, in the early stages an award DOI service. We're working with some of the DOE user facilities to assign DOIs coming out of uh, their facilities, the awards coming out of their facilities. Um, we're doing a lot with persistent identifiers for organizations. We have an internal organization authority um, that kind of has name variations and information describing the organizations. We're adding persistent identifiers to that so that we can kind of add it within our metadata. Um, we've maintained the DOE hierarchy in the Open Funder Registry, and as that's transitioning to ROAR, which Amanda will talk more about, um, we're making sure that kind of all of the, the DOE Open Funder Registry entries also are included in ROAR. And so if you go to the next slide, I um, just want to mention if, if you're interested in kind of finding more about our services or, or kind of our approach to per, uh, persistent identifiers generally, um, we have a site dedicated to this at osti.gov slash PIDS. And I will end also on the next slide with a question. Um, I mentioned that, you know, we're doing a lot to kind of curate the metadata, enhance it um, so that we have the highest quality metadata um, and, you know, can make the information even more discoverable and adding persistent identifiers in there. And when we are assigning the persistent identifiers, for example, for the research outputs, the DOIs, we can include this information in the DOI metadata. But we're also doing this curation work, and I, I know a lot of other organizations are as well. Um, and so my question is, you know, what are ways we can think of to, if, if your organization is enhancing metadata, how can we get that to the persistent identifier's own owners so that that metadata can be enhanced and kind of be the highest quality um, with uh, associated with the persistent identifiers? So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Alice. Thanks. Thanks so much, Carly. Great to see that version of a pit optimized world coming to real life at, uh, at DOE. Um, and I think your question is a very nice segue into Scott's talk, actually. So Scott is going to give us more of a publisher perspective on persistent identifiers. So over to you, Scott. I, I agree. That was a nice lead in a great presentation, Carly. Yeah, Scott Tanine here. I'm representing a publisher's perspective. I'm going to go pretty narrow in what I talk about. Well, first, let me talk about which publisher I'm from. Uh, this is Optica Publishing Group. We used to be known as the Optical Society of America. We are, as the slide says, the largest uh, publisher of peer-reviewed material on optics and photonics. So our community is very broad, laser science, astronomy, uh, material science, biomedical imaging, image processing, um, really, really broad range of uh, topics that we, we publish in. Uh, we can go to the next slide and I'll talk about how we use persistent identifiers. They are really key to a lot of the transactions that we do throughout the publishing process, these persistent identifiers. Uh, ORCID IDs to uh, unambiguously represent the authors. Um, increasingly, and what I'm gonna talk about mostly in my few slides I have are uh, ROARs, uh, Research Organization Registry Identifiers. Uh, where am I from? You know, that problem, it's, it, it's a tough problem. And ROARs are really helping us with, with some critical um, tasks that we need. Obviously funding, identifying funders is important and all of the other uh, resources connected to a, a paper that we publish or a conference uh, conference paper, uh, journal article uh, for ref DOIs to references, supplementary material, including uh, code and data sets. Um, before going to the next slide, I guess one comment to make and a pain point for publishers and kind of gets to what Carly was saying. A lot of publishers are getting these 
well, getting the information from the author and sometimes secondhand because the author may have 10 um, co-authors on the paper. And so trying to get the correct names of the institutions, names of the funders, uh, author names and, and other resources, usually the, the publisher and service providers have to invest a lot of resources into polishing up the information we have and trying to associate it with uh, an identifier. And we don't always get it right, obviously. So uh, that point may lead into the next slide where I want to talk about, thank you, um, ROARs used for read and publish agreements, because this, this is a really big, important aspect of a lot of um, publishers' uh, business these days. And what, what a read and publish agreement generally is, uh, a publisher will negotiate with one institution or more likely a consortium, consortium of institutions. And based on past publishing activity, they negotiate that the institutions or consortia will cover the publishing fees for the authors, along with subscriptions to the, to the journals. And so the question of how many authors are we going to include for the next three years, it's, it's based on knowing which authors are with which institutions. It's, it's a tough problem because consortia can be large, institutions can have children, and again, ROR's really, really can help bring this together. Um, but again, we're often relying on what the author provides. Um, I'll go through each one of these squares pretty quickly. I just talked about the first, first one, these contracts that are based on knowing where people are from. The next block is sort of the same thing. When we are, as a publisher, uh, indicating that this paper is going to be covered by this uh, read and publish agreement, we've got to be dead accurate. And with certain other types of um, PID activity, uh, even with funding, even with ROARS, sometimes close enough is good enough if you're just looking at a trend, like a, a trend for funding. But if, if, if you're going to award a $2,000 APC payment, you know, there, there's no room for error. It, it has to be dead accurate. So um, that will be relating to my provocative question at the end. Um, all right, these two other boxes here, uh, just making the point that what the authors give the publisher is, is often not really sufficient. Only about 15% of our authors even uh, are able to match their institution to an ROR. Uh, I'm sure we could improve that with a better UI and other tactics, but that, that's where that's where we are now. And finally, Optica Publishing Group and a lot of other publishers rely on the corresponding author for these entitlements for read and publish deals. And that's a whole nother can of worms. Uh, first of all, what is how do we all define corresponding author these days? Um, is it the person corresponding during the peer review process or is it the person you contact with questions after the paper's published. Um, the definition's problematic, and there's also um, potential for fraud and playing games and you know trying to move around who the corresponding author is when we all want transparency. So um, you know, having perhaps a agreed upon way to mark up in a JATS XML who the corresponding author is, and maybe Crossref being able to represent that or things that publishers are certainly thinking and talking talking about. So we can go to the next slide. Just have two more here. Again, touching on a topic Carly brought up, the publisher will assert PIDs based on what the author provided or other, other services, but sometimes a third party, often after we publish an article, will also assert um, PIDs and there's pluses and minuses. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, for example, we, like many publishers, participate in uh, PubMed Central, where if a paper is funded by um, NIH, we place that paper into PubMed Central. Um, sometimes uh, 
PubMed or PubMed Central will know more about funding than we did as the publisher. And they will add funders and funder IDs to the paper post-publication, but in the PubMed Central site, not in our site. And so we don't then know that we have an obligation sometimes to make a paper open access or to, to you know, maybe it's not in PubMed Central, but they'll contact us and say, where's this paper? It needs, you know, according to our records, it's eligible. So PMC is good about contacting us and probably about other publishers, but it just raises the point. This is kind of metadata inflation that um, creates a problem, but maybe an opportunity as well. Those of you who work with Crossref uh, know that Crossref will enhance metadata. For example, if you send the name of a funder across without a, a funder registry ID, Crossref will try to add that ID and like we do, you can harvest that back into your system. So that, that's great, but it's not always an accurate um, enhancement. So that can be a problem. Uh, finally, just another example here is uh, uh, we're, we're one of the publishers now working with ResearchGate where we syndicate content. And ResearchGate, sometimes they know a lot more than we do about um, the authors of the paper because Authors in ResearchGate have to create rich profiles. Um, back to something that John brought up, brought up about um, PIDs needing to be free and open. Um, consider that ResearchGate will often know usage, like they'll know which IPs are hitting our content. And they'll we, we don't know who they are. We don't know who those IPs belong to, but ResearchGate does. And so those could be leads for the publisher, but that's valuable information. ResearchGate or uh, IP registry, they're not just going to give us those PIDs. So sometimes if there's a, uh, a value to the PID, you know, business value, um, they're not going to just be open, uh, open exchange. There, there's gonna be, have to be some transaction, um, but an opportunity as well. You know, I'm not saying, not saying that's a, that's a negative. Um, we can go to the last slide. Uh, I have a contact me slide, but this is the provocative question slide. So hopefully I've set the table to ask, post these two questions. Again, they overlap a little bit with uh, what my colleagues brought up. Uh, we mainly get data and PIDs from authors as publishers. Um, should we expand? Is there a way to expand who's contributing the PIDs so it's less burdensome and more accurate? Uh, the funders, the uh, organizations who are part of these uh, read and publish agreements, and how, how do we do that? Uh, I don't have answers. I'm just raising the question here. And in terms of um, PIDs that are added by third parties, you know, there's a version of record for each article. Usually the publisher has it, like we'll have an article in our Optics Express that may have rich metadata and PIDs that we didn't, we didn't as a publisher, we didn't have and we didn't know about. Um, can we build out a better infrastructure? And what, what was that term? Something about trust among parties so that there's a better way to flow these PIDs, maybe better through Crossref, um, back into the version of record. So the version of record really uh, benefits from all that richness, all that enhancement. And so those are my, my two questions. And here's my contact if you want to get in touch and talk more about this. So thank you. That's Thanks so much, that. Scott. That was great. Um, so last but not least, we're going to hear from Amanda French of the Research Organisation Registry, which has raw come up quite a bit already. I do just want to encourage you all, um, if you have thoughts on any of the questions that have been asked so far, we'd love to hear your 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 thoughts. Um, there's been quite a few questions uh, in the Q&A as well, so please keep them coming because we're going to open this up um, after Amanda's uh, talk. So thank you, Amanda. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much um, for those terrific presentations. Uh, my name is Amanda French. Uh, I am the Technical Community Manager for ROAR, the Research Organization Registry, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about ROAR IDs as funder IDs. Next slide, please. So 
probably most of the people on this call and certainly the presenters know what Aurora ID is, but I thought I would give you just a very brief overview of Aurora record. Um, Aurora ID um, is a full URL, which you can see in the upper left of this screenshot from our web search of Roar. This is a Roar record for um, a funder that I personally had never heard of. It's a relatively minor funder, and I specifically wanted to show an example um, of a funder that we might not know about um, for a reason that I'll, I'll mention in a, in a moment. Um, you can see that we have uh, the name of this funder. We have what type of funder, or what type of organization it is. It's a company and it also funds some research. Other names it goes by, locations it goes by, its website. And included in the Roar record are mappings to other identifiers. And notably for this talk, notice that the, the Crossref funder ID is in this record as well. Um, also in the bottom left of this record, you can note that um, this organization has a parent organization and you may or may not be able to see it, um, but down in the, the bottom left in sort of small type, um, you can see the data uh, JSON view uh, of this record. We do have an API. We deliver a lot of these identifiers via API, um, as well as by our nice web search. Uh, but you can also see, I hope, uh, that this record was last modified in at the end of April, so not very long ago, uh, less than a month ago and that there's a link on the record to where anyone can suggest a change. Um, and this is important because this is one of the records that we've been updating um, as we um, reconcile ROAR with the Crossref funder registry in preparation for making ROAR a default and widely adopted identifier for funders. Um, just a couple other things about ROAR. ROAR, perhaps ironically, is not itself an organization. We are an initiative that is jointly operated by the California Digital Library, Crossref, and Datacite. Um, we have over 109,000 research organizations represented in ROAR currently, and all the metadata is CC0 and completely free to use and open. Next slide. So yes, as, as many of you may know, or as you may have learned on this call, um, the Crossref Open Funder Registry, formerly known as Fundref, which has um, been in operation for, I think, about uh, 12 years uh, and has been quite widely adopted, um, is merging with ROAR. So last fall, uh, Crossref announced a long-term plan to deprecate the Open Funder Registry in favor of ROAR. I noticed in the survey results, uh, someone mentioned multiple identifiers for the same thing as a problem. Uh, with persistent identifiers, and this merger is meant to solve that problem. Um, Roar was or originally developed because there were no um, author affiliation identifiers that were free and open and community driven, um, like the funder registry. Um, but we've been working to re uh, reconcile these two registries for quite a while, ever since 2022, um, long before we made this announcement. Um, as you may have seen on the, the last slide, there are over 109,000 organizations in ROAR, and there are um, 43,000 or so in the funder registry at the moment. Um, some other facts about this transition, the Open Funder Registry itself is going to remain available at least through the end of 2024. I would be um, very surprised if it uh, doesn't last quite a bit longer than that. Um, and then the funder's endpoint of the Crossref API, which Chorus uses, and the Crossref funding search will remain available at least until ROAR IDs become the predominant funding identifier for newly registered content. So this is definitely a phased transition and is meant to be such. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we've been working quite hard to make sure that the metadata in the funder registry is represented in ROAR. Um, Carly mentioned that um, DOE has been working with ROAR to make sure that their um, hierarchy is properly represented, and we have been working with other, especially U.S. federal agencies uh, and some other national uh, funding agencies as well to make sure that uh, those organizational hierarchies are correct and complete. That's a very important aspect of this work. Um, we've been conducting uh, user interviews uh, with uh, especially publishers who use the funder registry to better understand their needs and concerns. If you would like to um, uh, participate in just such an interview, I would be more than happy to set one up. Um, my contact information will be at the end of this presentation. Um, 
We have added funder as an organization type in ROAR, and that has been, you know, quite a simple thing. Any ROAR record that has a mapped funder ID, we have marked as a funder. Um, there may be, in addition, future funders that do not have funder IDs. And then we've been collaborating with Crossref on these matching strategies. Um, as Scott mentioned, Crossref can and does match text strings for funders to uh, funder IDs. And we have been working with them to make sure that those strategies um, are good and that they can encompass matching to ROAR IDs as well. Um, the other thing is I'm going to put in the chat um, this particular uh, link um, to this help documentation because this has I think probably all of the links that I'm sharing in these slides um, and this is a great sort of uh, FAQ that we've uh, published to try to answer all of the questions about this. Next slide. So here are some here's some data about the overlap between the funder registry and ROAR. And this is quite recent. This is from a few days ago. So this pie graph on the left shows that there are 43,785 funders represented in the funder registry. And of those, um, nearly half, 20,000, are also represented in ROAR. Now, this may seem like a fairly low number, but we've done quite a bit of analysis and many of the funders who have IDs in the funder registry are never never used. They're never asserted as funders of publications. Um, we've analyzed primarily Crossref data, but also we've looked at ORCID data and data site data, and uh, fully a third of funder registry IDs are not being used to identify funders in publications. Um, so what we are doing is we've been um, working quite hard to make sure that um, funders in the funder registry are also in ROAR, but we've been prioritizing that based on how many funding references or funding assertions those funders have. So the pie graph on the right, which is green and pink, um, will show you that over 94% of assertions of funding in Crossref records do have a corresponding ROAR ID. So for instance, you take one article, a journal article, for instance, it may have multiple funders. Um, and one of those funders might be, for instance, the NSF. That's a single funder ID, and it's very important to get that NSF record correct. So, but you know, there's something like, um, you know, a, a huge number of the funding assertions in Crossref are from these major funders, NSF, DOE, NIH, things like that. So by, by concentrating on those ones that are most used, um, we, we want to make sure that the most useful funder IDs are represented in ROAR. And the, the record that I showed you earlier, Zimmer Biomet, we, which we've just you know, updated uh, about a month ago, has 283 uses in Crossref metadata, as opposed to something like, you know, 130,000 or possibly even more than that assertions for a large US agency. Uh, next slide. Um, here is just an example. I bet this has probably changed uh, since last October, uh, but this is um, a visual representation of organizational hierarchy in ROAR. All of these um, entities that you see on the screen do have separate ROAR IDs and they're all linked in ROAR metadata so that you can know, for instance, that the Brookhaven National Laboratory has uh, the US Department of Energy as its parent. Next slide. So Crossref is also um, collaborating with ROAR and working quite hard on this transition. Um, one of the things they are doing right now, and I can tell you this is very, very active development, um, Crossref is making it possible to accept ROAR IDs in every place in the DOI schema that they currently accept funder IDs. Um, that should be, uh, I, that will be released, uh, I would say, by early Q3. It's always hard to tell with these things, but um, it's imminent this year for, for sure. Um, we're also looking at working on a way of doing this enhancement or inflation, I suppose, uh, in, in that wherever there are um, funder IDs in Crossref metadata, Crossref may choose to insert um, an assertion saying this funder ID maps to this ROAR ID. 
Um, we've also been working together to improve these matching strategies. So instead of mapping one ID to another ID, um, matching is more about matching text strings to identifiers. So both Roar and Crossref are working on those uh, to make sure that those are as accurate as possible. Um, also, Crossref has been participating in these user interviews we've been doing. And of course, they're continuing to maintain um, the existing funder registry infrastructure, including the registry itself, uh, which is uh, curated by Elsevier. Um, and then Crossref maintains the kind of technical infrastructure that um, makes the funder registry files available and makes it available uh, through an API and a web-based search. Next slide. And Something that I think not enough people are aware of is that Roar is already widely used as a funder identifier. Um, Chorus um, is using Roar um, uh, as well as funder IDs and is moving toward using Roar even more. Um, major systems like ORCID and Datasite uh, accept Roar for funders. Uh, many, many repository systems, especially the repository systems that have been participating in the Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative run by NIH, have been uh, implementing Roar for Funders. We did, uh, Dryad was one of the first Roar adopters for author affiliations, and um, they uh, made a major effort and switched all of their funding identifiers over to Roar just in the past few months, uh, and it's been working beautifully. Uh, new systems like OpenAlex and OA Report are, are also using Roar to identify funders. Next slide. Um, the Datasite API makes it possible to, um, to see which identifiers are being used for which cases, which is really wonderful. And Roar is already accounting for nearly 30% of funder identifiers in Datasite. Um, as you can see, obviously, um, uh, the funder ID, formerly Fundref, is, uh, accounts for the majority of funder identifiers. Um, and then a few systems are still using Grid. I think those are primarily Figshare inst installations. Uh, and then a few are using ISNI, uh, but Roar is definitely increasing its share. Next slide. Um, so at this, I think, is my, my last slide. Um, I, you know, there's no denying that um, there's work. There's work to be done in transitioning from the funder registry to Roar, um, but for there are a lot of benefits. Um, as we said, there we're there's no need to use both the funder registry and Roar. Um, you can use one single registry for both identifying uh, funders and author affiliations and author affiliations for multiple purposes, including for open access deal management. Um, so publishers, uh, I work with a lot of um, smaller publishers. Um, who have never had any identifier for author affiliations. And so for them, they were going to have to adopt Roar anyway, or they were going to want to adopt Roar anyway for author affiliations. So in the course of doing that, um, they're saying, even if they were already using the funder registry, they, it will be simpler for them ultimately to just use Roar for organizations. Um, Roar has um, open metadata, uh, open tools. We hear from everybody that they're very easy to use. We have a modern REST API, totally open um, data set. Uh, we have, um, uh, I think, quite a pretty web-based search uh, user interface. Um, we curate the Roar registry very carefully, and we make sure that it's transparent, and we are community-led and community-governed. And then that's all from me. Uh, next, uh, my ending question, my product uh, provoking question is I really would love to hear from you about your primary concern about the transition from the funder registry to Roar, but also what opportunities it opens up for you. And then well, last slide. Thanks so much, Amanda, and, and everybody's been really interesting. I'm sure I've, we, there's been quite a lot of questions that have come up in the Q&A that everybody has very efficiently been answering. So I think, Howard, can we switch to seeing everybody while we, we have the discussion in the Q&A? Wonderful, thank you. So most of the questions that have come up in the Q&A have already been answered. There's one that I would quite like to get this group's, and, and some of them are quite specific for individuals who spoke, so I think that's probably better answered in the uh, in the chat. But there is one sort of slightly broader one, which I think I would especially like Carly and John probably to get your views on, but anybody can jump in, which is around the expansion of identifiers to intellectual property patents and that sort of thing, which I know there is some work that's gone on. There's a couple of organizations that have been looking at this for a while, but I don't know whether either of you or any of you have anything that you could share on that. 
sorry to put you on the spot, <laughs> but hopefully you saw the question in the Q&A, so not completely yeah. on the spot. I mean, I, I can say that, um, so just to refresh people's memory, so um, Todd and I were co-chairs of a working group that looked into trying to build recommendations for a U.S. national pitch strategy. And as part of that, we looked at different places where uh, use cases where persistent identifiers are commonly used. And a part of the report that I didn't go into is also isolated some gaps where there is still not common usage. So definitely, you know, IP and licensing and patents are are things that exist in the world, of course. But like the the common use case and a solidification of a community around that use case has not necessarily happened in those communities. And um, patents and licensing information is actually two of the things that we highlighted in, in our report. So I think there are definitely um, strategies and people and groups that are tackling this, but there hasn't been a consistent application of a of a of a strategy for a persistent identifier community that i know of uh yet and so one of the reasons for us to highlight this in our report is to showcase emerging places where we do need to have that work done um but also to showcase that there are strategies that there are ways to do it now and there is more work to be done so that we understand that this isn't a gap in the sense of uh, a vacuum but more of one that just needs to evolve as we move forward Right. Thank you, Carly. Yeah. So, so I think this is a very important conversation to have. I, I mean, from from um, I guess the the DOE perspective, we do think of patents as something that kind of emanates from the research that we fund, and I imagine that most of the other agencies would think about it the same way. Um, and I I know there are a lot of other agency colleagues on. I don't know if anyone uh, from USPTO is on, but I'll just say that you know um, I know that that's something that they're talking about, thinking about internally. Um, and you know we've had some conversations about you know if existing identifiers would you know would make sense and be helpful, or as John has talked about, you know obviously there's incredible infrastructure already for patents, and so could that in infrastructure potentially transition to kind of meet the the characteristics or kind of in the U.S. government context, the, the definition of a persistent identifier. So um, it sounds like there's a lot more conversation to have, but definitely uh, important and something that, that we're thinking about. Yeah. Thanks for raising that question for, and for answering. I suspect that if we were back, back here in five years time, the answers would be quite different and we hopefully will have moved along the path well by that time. Great, so I'm gonna move on. Um, we have a couple of discussion questions for the speakers. Um, uh, Audience members, please, we still very much encourage you to add either your thoughts on the speaker's questions or your own questions. Um, we apparently do have a little bit of flexibility. So if we need to go a little bit over the half past, um, we can do, we won't if, the, if we don't need to, um, but please do keep your questions coming. But in the meantime, um, one of the questions that I had for all of you is a kind of, where do you want to get to and what are the barriers to getting there question? And I think Scott, I will start with you, please. Yes, well, I think the thrust of what I was trying to talk about, and I got some questions too about it, is can are there more efficient and more trusted ways to get the uh, persistent identifiers into the publisher system or whatever system it is, rather than relying on the contributing author or some other party who um, isn't as motivated, isn't going to be as incentivized as they need to be, in my opinion. That's somebody sent me a question in the chat about that. Is there a way to incentivize authors to be more accurate, to to take more action? And I, I don't think there is, quite honestly. I think that the answer probably lies from other parties who are going to be more incentivized at least in this situation, for, for uh, research paper that, that's being submitted to a publisher. So so in a way for you, authors are kind of the barrier um, and, and and we need to find a solution that we need to find either a way for authors to, to make it easier for authors so it's not a barrier for them or... Uh, or I, I think so. I think that that's worth um, exploring and, and, and seeing if there, there is a way forward again to, to take that burden off the authors and put it on a more incentivized uh, party. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you, yeah. Amanda. Oh, just to say that um, 
I do think this is a major value that publishers and service providers can add. Um, it's difficult because, you know, very often, you know, the author is the only one who knows some of this information. So um, it's difficult for, to cut the author out of that loop. But I do, I do talk, it is really interesting to me how many people um, are adding raw IDs at different stages. A number of people are building it into their forms in the way that Scott described described. And I think um, Zenodo actually is seeing something similar, where um, people are typing in a type ahead that's powered by the raw ID, the name of their organization, but they may just type it and hit enter instead of selecting from the controlled list, um, which they do need to be allowed to do because not everything is in Roar. Um, so, um, yeah, Amanda, I'd like to comment on that too. Sure, because yeah. That question, remember I said that less than 15% of authors match to Roar? And I got a question, well, how, how does that happen? I mean, I saw that, yeah. So we also use a type ahead, you know, we, we use a type ahead. And if authors type ahead and do a match, obviously we get the roar. Or if they type the exact correct name or any variant, they get the roar. But typically they have some idea of what their institution's called. It's abbreviated, whatever it is, they just type that and that's what we get. So then the publisher has to take additional action, maybe get it wrong. But it's tough. The where are you from? What is it? Waif? That problem is 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 really hard. And if you have 10 co-authors and you're trying to waif them as well, it is really, really difficult. I, I think almost a non-starter in some cases. Yeah. And as I as I mentioned, you know, I think Zenodo is is seeing some of the same same problems. So you're you're by no means the only one. But I have seen some publishers who just um they they will accept a, just a text, you know, like the PDF, and they take it from the TD, PDF yeah, and, yeah, you yeah. know, enhance it midway through the production process. So, you know, while it is, it is difficult and it's a, it's a difficult um, process, I definitely think it's one of the major values that service providers and publishers can provide. No, no doubt. Yeah. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Carly, you look like you'd like to say something. Well, I was going to kind of comment on this uh, directly, but but also can kind of uh, answer the, the question more broadly. But just on the um, adding roars, I, I mentioned kind of this organization authority that we have developed internally. So we have kind of decades of metadata, just like publishers would as well. And so what we've done is we've taken every name variation we have ever seen. We've collected that over decades. And that's what we have in our authority. And so if any variation of that name comes in, we can now match that to Aurora automatically because we're kind of pulling from this authority. And so I don't I don't think we actually have plans right now to use Aurora type ahead because we'll already um, be able to kind of do that behind the scenes with with any uh, with any name variation that comes in. And and then what what our plan is because of course there are things gonna that are gonna come in that we've never seen before and are not in our authority. And so we're gonna have our our team of metadata curators kind of. Um, do that work manually, uh, at least for now. Um, but one thing that we are uh, looking to do is, um, and this kind of goes back to the, you know, kind of broader question of um, what we might try to go to is, you know, we want to try to make this information available for other people to use as well, um, particularly organizations that we work closely with so that, you know, if if you're seeing the, the same types of name variations, you know, you, you could kind of match those to the roars as well, or, or other persistent identifiers, you know, we're pulling in all of those other identifiers that Amanda talked about that are also included in the ROAR metadata. And so where we're looking to go to it with DOE, and I imagine a lot of the other federal agencies is, you know, like I said, kind of having persistent identifiers in as much of the metadata as possible to try to really see all of the, the benefits um, that can be realized from using persistent identifiers. And, you know, I think uh, one of the things we regularly hear about is uh, researcher burden. And so, you know, I think uh, that can really be reduced with further uptake of ROAR, right? It, it's it's a little bit of um, chicken and egg <laughs> problem, right? Because you don't see as many benefits as you, you can realize until um, information is populated, for example, in ORCID records so that you can use that to auto-populate an application or reporting. And so that's what we're trying to, to work towards and also just um, creating communities where we can have discussions about this, share practices, potentially best practices, and really all learn from each other. 
Thanks, Carly. Yeah, I think the community thing is super important, isn't it? I feel like it's that, you know, nobody really benefits until everybody benefits um, approach. Um, John, I'm going to go to you next, please, with the same question, if you can remember what it was, which is where would you like to get to from the perspective of the work you're doing and what are the what's the main barrier to, to getting there? Well, um, I work in many different aspects of persistent identifiers um, from the specifics of the work that we did with the National PID Strategy Group. Um, you know, as you were mentioning, there is um, there are a lot of different communities and constituents that are trying to find a way forward with um, within the PID landscape. Um, the goal of the work that we're doing is to offer some guidance within the U.S. context. Obviously, research is international, um, but just as other countries and regions are building national pitch strategies or uh, pitch strategies, we're looking at ways to address some of the uniquely American aspects of this, this problem. Um, the work that Carly does at OSTI is you know, a great model of the kind of specific infrastructure that we have here in the U.S., the focus on research. Um, and in many ways, uh, you know, trying to decode some of the policy work that you that that is out there and the guidance that's out there, so that we can use that to build best practice that not only supports American research ecosystem, but then also has an interconnectedness with global systems as well. I think that's kind of the goal with our project is to kind of demystify some of that. And I think the work we did around the desirable characteristics is also in that vein. It's really about trying to. Uh, allow everyone to have a common vocabulary to discuss these issues with some level of depth so that we're not just using catchphrases and jargon to signify things, but we have some understanding about what they are underneath that. And I think that it's important and it's interesting that we all, and it's great that we all have um, interest in PIDs and PIDs are, you know, have, uh, are having their day, but it's also really important that through that enthusiasm, we're also building knowledge and depth and understanding of what we're aiming towards. And so I think that really for me right now, one of the main things I'm trying to focus on within our group is how do you find digestible ways that are quick and easy for the enthusiasts out there to really understand the complexity of what we're aiming for? Great, thank you. Um, Amanda, I'm gonna to go to you next, please. And then Carly, come back to you. Uh, and this is on, I'm sorry, which question? I'm sorry. <laughs> so it's, well, you pardon. kind of, we, we sort of I'm worked around this a bit. This is a, uh, in your world, uh, where are you trying to get to and what's the barrier? And I think you've mm. talked a bit about yeah. this. In, I mean, that's kind of what you were talking about anyway. Yeah. But uh... Right. So uh, let's see. Specifically about war for funders, I would say that the uh, where we're trying to get to is war as a default identifier for funders. Yeah. Um, one of the um, opportunities about this is that there certainly are a lot of smaller publishers um, and, you know, open access publishers and like, institutional publishers, for instance, like university libraries that have publishing programs that uh, are using systems that have never had any identifier for funders. So for them, you know, where we'd like to get to is say, hey, let's build war into these systems so that these funders do have an identifier so that it's structured metadata and not just text on a PDF or, you know, seven funders in one free text field, that kind of thing. Um, where the barrier comes in is that um, the funder registry was very widely adopted, which was great. It was very necessary. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I, to be honest, feel a little guilty asking people who have, you know, uh, built all kinds of um, technology around the funder registry and asking them to move to this. So that's why we're really trying to to really listen to people who are using the funder registry and um, really trying to make that easy for them and uh, make it a phase transition. So that that's the primary problem, as it were. Um, it but we. Yeah, we, we do we do hear a lot of, as I say, support for it, yeah. um, partly because I actually think probably the main um, benefit of, of using Roar over the funder registry is the transparency of the curation. Um, so right now, if you ask for a new record in Roar or if you ask for a change to a Roar ID, you can see that request, you can track the discussion about it, if any. Um, we have, we're quite proud of our turnaround time. Um, uh, most requests, unless they're extremely difficult and require a lot of discussion, are two to four weeks before it gets published in the registry. 
Um, so uh, we think that it's it's a very good curation process that we have at Roar. Wonderful. Um, there is a question about this in the chat, which I'll leave you to answer, Amanda. I want to go on to Carly. If there's time, I would like to take a little bit more of your time because there's a great question in the Q&A about trust in, in global PID infrastructure, which I would love to get a quick answer from all of you on. So, Carly, um, I'd love to hear your response to where do you want to get to and what's the barrier? And then if if um, Howard and Tara, it's OK to just take a couple more minutes, I would love to get quick answers on that trust question as well. So I, I think I already kind of answered the where we want to go, but yeah. just in terms of, uh, you know, barriers, I, I think it's really, um, I think as has been mentioned, finding ways to talk about this, maybe to folks that are not as invested as we are in PIDs, um, to, to get folks interested and to really show the benefits and to have that culture shift. I mean, I think as we are all familiar with, uh, you know, culture shift takes time. And, you know, PIDs are what we're going on 20 years now <laughs> from the start of this. And there's still a lot of work to be done. And so I think it's just, you know, finding ways to engage folks that um, are, are not as excited about it as we are and really showing the benefits. Yeah, I think we underestimate the challenges around social issues. Uh, at our peril and those of us who are not technologists always think the technology is going to be hard but no it really isn't compared with the with the sort of adoption the social side of things so fully agree with that thank you okay well as I say I'd love to end with this wonderful question um, in the Q&A how can trust in a global PID infrastructure be maintained regarding the integrity of the data registered can't be changed on a whim with the aim of misleading and slightly different but also will there be rights assigned to a PID i.e it can't be deleted without due process so it's sort of sort of tied in but really this this issue of how can we well I guess not just maintain but how can we develop and maintain trust in a global PID infrastructure so would anybody like to volunteer to, to have a first go at that yeah I mean I can I would just say it's a summary of everything we've said so far which is that it's a combination of technical and social contracts um when we we're saying things like PID governance and community and these types of terms, what we're talking about is those types of, of guidance and best practices. So one of the reasons why, you know, Alice started with the list of priority PIDs. I mean, those are, that's like, it's a brand name, but it's a signifier that there is some level of guarantees. So many of the things that you're talking about in the question around building trust are not necessarily in the brand name, it's in that those policies and those guidance and the community practices that are underneath those. I think the same is true for those that are not in that list. And so we want to aim towards building spaces where those types of best practices and trust indicators exist. The, the way those happen is through community buy-in because, you know, the way you understand longevity is by having more than one person involved, you know, and I think it's also making sure that the coalitions around persistent identifier communities include many memory institutions like academic institutions and museums and libraries, as well as governments and other agencies that exist in our world and humanity for the reason of creeping, keeping things around and to maintaining and have, offering guarantee and custodianship of stuff. And so I think that we want to make sure that we're not just working with corporations that or just projects, but also, you know, building coalitions beyond those to ensure that there is a community around it that not only has the policies, but has the mandate to be around forever. It takes a village. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Scott. Yes, I also think key to building trust and success is the third parties like Chorus, like Crossref, like the uh, like Amanda, your group, the ROR, ROAR, um, in not only um, exhibiting really um, behavior that has a lot of integrity to it, but also uh, practicality, practical solutions that are not over idealistic. And that I think intersects with you said, Alice, about the, um, you know, the social aspect because it's really easy to get over idealistic about solving problems with, uh, you know, technology or new standards, but trusted groups that really know the gory details and the plumbing, and also have in, in, in exhibited integrity over many years and are well connected with all the organizations. But for me, that makes all the difference. So I just wanted to weigh in with that. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Carly, what about you? 
Well, I, I don't know that I have much more to add. I, I think they really, really covered it. Um, um, as, as has been talked about, I think it's really the community and bringing in broad perspective and um, all of those organizations that um, are really kind of invested in making this successful and making sure that there's infrastructure that's supported for the long term. Thank you. Amanda? I might um, go a little rogue and speak up for the technology, <laughs> just because, um, uh, one of, which, which of course is social, right? I mean, people have to decide to do things to technology. It's not as though the community aspect is not three times as important as the technology. I mean, I think one of the things that has come out of this panel is um, exchange of metadata, interoperability of metadata is a thing that we're always seeing as a need in systems. Um, and it is, uh, I mean, speaking pragmatically, um, you know, open can be a kind of a moral signifier, but honestly, when you're talking about metadata, you have to have open metadata if you're going to exchange it between systems, between all of the systems. Um, it just is, it just is much easier that way. Um, if, if any system can use it, if any system can read it. Um, and then it's sometimes it's the, the writing back that can be a bit, um, a bit dicey. So yeah, I, I would, I would love to, see, I think that's an important, an, an important aspect is making sure that, that metadata is really interoperable and exchangeable. And you're completely right. It's not that the technology is not important. I mean, I, I you know, there's so many examples where actually you've got the social buy-in, but the technology is so difficult that nobody wants to use it. So the two definitely are, you know, part and parcel of the same thing. So I, I don't, I think it's just that there is often a tendency, particularly on the people who, in my experience, who build the technology to underestimate how much, how much importance to give to the to the sort of social buy-in because I think there can be a bit of if you build it they will come mentality and actually that's not always the case so but wonderful well thank you I think that wraps things up from our perspective so Howard I'm sure on behalf of all the speakers thank you again for this opportunity and we'll hand back to you to wrap up well um, that was quite a session lots to think about a uh, huge thank you to all of our panelists and also a big thank you again to our sponsors, ACM, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, RTI Press, and STM. And look for more chorus events. We've got lots, many more coming up. Um, check us out on our website and hope to see you back at one of those events in the near future. Uh, thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. So long. Thank you.